I think everyone's been admitted. Welcome everyone. I'm Kate Wheeler. I am president and CEO of Crystal Cove Conservancy. Thank you so much for joining us for the second in our ongoing Zoom series. Uh, it's great to see all of your names. I just wish we could all catch up in person. But until then, we're really grateful that you're all with us uh, here on Zoom. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of notes for everybody on the call. If you want to, you can put your chat, your questions in the chat as we go along. I'll be keeping an eye on that and uh, send those questions to the panel as we can. I'll try to get to as many as we can. You also might want to put your uh, set your window to, to speaker view. To do that, you'll see in the Zoom window on the top right, uh, you'll, see, you'll see view. Just click on view and select speaker view instead of gallery view. And that I think will be helpful to you. So I'm thrilled to have um, some great folks with us tonight. I've got Dick G, who's an architect and project manager with Spectra Historic Construction, uh, and they are the main contractor on our North Beach project. I also have Dan G, the president of Crystal Cove Management Company and the man who oversees this project on our behalf. Also Eric Dimmel, who's the central sector superintendent for the Orange Coast District of California State Parks, our superintendent. And of course, Laura Davick, the founder of Crystal Cove Conservancy and the chair of the Heritage Legacy Project for California, which is the campaign that aims to restore these last 17 cottages on the North Beach. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, but before I do, uh, most of you know Laura, I'm sure of that. But for those who don't, in, in so many ways, Laura has been the heart of Crystal Cove. She's been working tirelessly for more than two decades to protect Crystal Cove and to turn it into what it is today. She grew up here in cottage number two, which I believe is the background that she's sitting in front of tonight. Uh, her parents bought cottage number two uh, after falling in love there as teenagers when the cove was a haven for summer tent camping. Uh, growing up, Laura's family spent every weekend at the cove and in her words, she was able to really roam wild here. It was a place that she could be fearless, walking the beach, exploring tide pools, and basically tagging along after his, her dad on, on all things. Her first job was making shakes at the Shake Shack. It was glorious, I'm sure. For decades, the cove was populated by artists and families like Laura's living together in this amazing little enclave. In 1979, as a lot of you know, the Irvine Company sold a swath of coastal property including Crystal Cove and its cottages to California State Parks. And the families living here, including Laura's, had until their leases expired in 2001 to leave. And that I think was when Laura set her sights on protecting Crystal Cove and opening it up for more families and, and visitors to enjoy by stopping a planned luxury resort development on the property. What we may not have known then, but we certainly know now, is that when Laura sets her sights on something, you can pretty much bank on it happening. Um, she's accomplished much of what she set out to do, but we're not quite there yet. With Laura leading the campaign now to fund the project, we've got our sights set on these last 17 cottages on the North Beach. Laura, can I turn it over to you? Yes, Kate. And thanks so much for that great walk down memory lane. I feel like I'm about 12 with my horse in front of cottage two. Um, anyway, it's been a, an amazing journey and as a result of the cove that I know that we all love. When I think back over the last 22 years since this organization began, there are several ingredients and milestones that have contributed to where we are today. Certainly, it's always about getting the right people on the bus, and I think most of them are all right here. And it's also about the partnerships that you build along the way. Our innovative partnership with California State Parks has been really instrumental and has become a, a true model for public-private partnerships. Sometimes our ideas were a bit out of the box, uh, but the passion and dedication of all parties have always prevailed and we've found the right answer to complex challenges. When I think back to 2003, when the preservation and public use plan was approved for the first real public use of the historic district, that was certainly an incredible milestone for this park. But as often is the case, you may have a great plan, but no funding to implement it. And that was certainly true here as well. Over the past 18 years, including the pre-planning, phase one, phase two, phase three infrastructure, 
we have invested about $44 million thanks to the many partners who have stood by us and understood the importance and the value of restoring one of California's most iconic destinations. You see, Crystal Cove is not just another beautiful spot along our coastline, but one with a really rich history. Beginning with the Irvine Ranch, violent filmmakers, prohibition days, plein air painters, tent camping, and the families who built and lived in these handmade little cottages. Crystal Cove, you see, is deemed to be the last intact example of early vernacular architecture, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. But Crystal Cove is the real deal. Fast forward to today, so much has been accomplished with 29 of the 46 historic cottages being restored and open for public use, some of the most affordable lodging on the coast of California. The last huge milestone was a 11 year fundraising effort to complete all of the much needed infrastructure for the project. And if you've been walking down the beach over the last two years, you've watched this amazing feat and seen all of this heavy construction going on and, and all of the work that our team has been doing. You see the squatters that built these cottages in 1920s and 30s, they had no idea that these cottages would ever last almost 100 years. So today, through generous support and contributions, we're looking forward to continuing with our restoration of the next batch of cottages. And that is our next milestone that Eric, Dan, and Dick will share with you now. Thanks so much, Laura. I was trying to share my screen there. I wasn't sure if it was working, um, but I'll make sure I get it up later. Uh, we have some nice aerial footage of that project. So I hope it worked. I'm not sure if it did, though. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Before we dive in with our panel, I'd like to provide just a bit of context who the Conservancy is for those of you who might be new and what we do. Many of you know Crystal Cove because you know the cottages or the beachcomber cafe. What you may not know is how the cottages and the food service in the park support so much of our broader work. Because we hold the concession contract in the park, we're both the nonprofit partner and the concessionaire here at Crystal Cove State Park. Revenue from both the cottage rentals and food service stays right here at the Cove supporting our work to protect, preserve, and educate. Like so many relationships in the park, this relationship is a, is a symbiotic one. The cottages and food service provide revenue and facilities to support our work in STEM education, while also supporting ongoing work to maintain the historic structures in the park. In turn, our education programs, while devel developing the, the minds of young scientists, and cultivating their connections with our planet provide rigorous and really engaging science education that's grounded in the ongoing conservation projects that we have here in the park, habitat restoration, as well as environmental research. And then data that students who participate in our education programs, data that they collect in turn informs land managers' responses to these critical conservation questions and helps us protect the essential habitats for our residents, those gnat catchers and snowy plover and owl limpets, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. Today, our STEM education programs supported by cottage revenue serve more than 8,000 students every year. Almost three quarters of those students come from our most under-resourced Title I schools. The completion of this project will not just double our over overnight occupancy, allowing thousands more students, uh, thousands more Californians and their families an affordable place to have a, a coastal retreat. But will more than double, will more than, excuse me, quadruple the funds available to support education programs. None of this, of course, happens without California state parks, as Laura said. We are because they are, and we just couldn't ask for a better partner. We're especially fortunate here at Crystal Cove State Park to have a superintendent in Eric Dimmel who understands our mission and our goals and works so hard on our behalf. I speak to a lot of uh, park partners around the state and I've learned that not every organization has the kind of close partnership with their superintendent and therefore with California State Parks as we do. So I'm really excited to turn it over to Eric. He began with State Parks as a seasonal lifeguard in 1986, I believe at Huntington State Beach. Uh, came to Crystal Cove shortly after that. He's spent a decade at both Huntington State Beach and at Crystal Cove State Park. He was promoted to superintendent in 2013 and then became our park superintendent after that. 
I think I can say though for that I can speak for Eric and say that this is more than just a job. He really this park is important to him. He loves the place. Uh, it's personal. He's a local. Uh, so Eric. Okay. Well, I, I think I lost you the last bit there, Kate. So can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, Kate, thank you for the opportunity to discuss and provide information about my favorite park. Uh, of the 280 units in the state park system, this is definitely my favorite. Um, as Kate said, it's more than just a job. I, uh, I proposed to my wife right off of uh, Split Rock here, scuba diving, and uh, come down here every um, every chance I get with my family, including our, our annual Christmas card, which we've been doing for the last 13 years down here. Um, so um, while there are many things that are unique about Crystal Cove State Park, there are two things that I think truly stand out and help make Crystal Cove the success that it is. Uh, back in the early 2000s, when California State Parks was opening up the cottages for rental and the restaurants for food service and looking for a concessionaire, they very much wanted to ensure that the new visitor experience was a success. So they were open to different ideas about how this would operate and what the concession contract would look like. Now, Kate alluded it to it a little bit more in her um, early comments, but I, I'm gonna hit on two aspects here that have really contributed to the success. Uh, the first unique aspect is that this park's nonprofit, the Crystal Cove Conservancy, is also the concessionaire. Well, you say, so what? Well, in most state parks, they have a separate nonprofit and concessionaire in their park. In that scenario, the nonprofit relies solely on fundraising and maybe a small gift shop to generate some monies to help the park and the nonprofit accomplish their goals. Uh, the concessionaire in that scenario runs their business and after paying a percentage of their gross revenue to the state, which goes into the state's big pot of revenue, the rest is profit that is retained by the concessionaire. In the case of Crystal Coast State Park, the conservancy is both the nonprofit and the concessionaire. So monies that would normally be kept as profit by another concessionaire are instead used by the Crystal Cove Conservancy to further the goals of our partnership. The second unique aspect is the contract that was set up itself. It basically outlines that the majority of the rent that the Crystal Cove Conservancy would normally pay to the state of California and end up in that big bucket of revenue, instead is paid into a facility improvement account whose funds stay here in the park and are utilized to maintain the facility and also put towards cottage registration efforts here in the park that we're going to be discussing here tonight. That's great. Thanks, Eric. I think it is a unique, um, it's a unique setup here. And the fact that we are the concessionaire and the nonprofit partner and that we have such a long contract with state parks really allowed us to develop a unique uh, model that I think supports the park and the conservancy. Uh, Dick and Dan, I want to come to you, but first proper introductions. Many of you know Dan from his very long association with Crystal Cove Conservancy. Uh, what you may not know, Dan is a civil engineer by training and had a long and successful entrepreneurial career in that field. He worked his way up from his start as a junior engineer with Caltrans uh, to the cre creation and eventual sale of two large corporations, one in pre-stressed pre concrete, which grew under his leadership to become one of the largest in the nation of its kind, and one in communications that worked in, in varied locations, including St. Petersburg, Russia, Prague, Czech Republic, and London, England. All of this led him eventually to serve as president of the Ocean Institute in Dana Point from 2001 to 2005, when he oversaw the completion of a new 33,000 square foot edu ocean education center. And then here to us at Crystal Cove Conservancy, where he served as the president of the Conservancy's for-profit arm that manages the concession and the cottage restoration activities here in the park since 2006. Dan, I know you're really busy right now. Thank you for carving out time tonight to hang out with us. Well, thank you, Kate. Um, I think uh, that's probably enough on my background. And I certainly wanna save as much time for 
questions in this program. So I would simply say thank you very much for all of you being here. Uh, and I assure you the panel is waiting to receive lots of good questions. Absolutely. Uh, now I'll turn to Dick. Dick was trained as an, uh, Dick G, no relation to Dan G. Dick was trained as an architect at UC Berkeley and oversees pre preservation consulting, design, build, and historic construction projects for Spectra Historic Construction. Dick's work in preservation has included rehabilitation <laughs> projects like the Eastern Columbia Building, the Los Angeles Coliseum, and multiple buildings at the El Pueblo de Los Angeles. He's worked on a number of National Register buildings, California State Historic Resources, and local landmarks, including the El Capitan Office Building and Theater, the Hillview apart Apartments in Hollywood, the Walker House in San Dimas, and has overseen almost all of the restoration of the historic buildings at the Pachanga and Pala Indian Reserva uh, Tribal Reservations. He's worked on every aspect of these types of projects from permitting and securing historic tax credits to design and construction. And he's received numerous awards for his work. Dick, we're glad not only ha to have you with us here tonight, but to have you overseeing this project every day. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, certainly, um, you know, it's been a it's great journey in, in my career. I didn't start off to uh, want to be a, a historic architect, but um, one of my first jobs, I, I was able to, to uh, work at a firm where we just started working on historic projects, and I, and I love history, so uh, this is really what I enjoy. Uh, I've had two phases of my career. I started off as an architect for uh, for most of my career, and um, and a, a few years ago, I moved into construction, so um, uh, when I decided to do so, uh, a lot of my architect's friends said that I, I moved over to the dark side, so... Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I prefer to say now that uh, I've just just my career has been adaptively reused. So, uh, so now I'm on. I, now I, I get to serve on both sides of the table, where I can collaborate as both in as, as an architect and a, and a constructor. Oh, great! Well, it's good to have you with us. Thanks for making the time, Dick. We appreciate it. Uh, Dan, I think we want to start with you because the, I think one of the big questions in the room is to tell us about this project, these 17 cottages. Where are we in the process? What's been done? What's left to do? Give us an update. Okay. Um, uh, it's going to be hard for me to contain this to a, a short uh, description, but I'm going to try real hard to do that. So um, the project basically consists of two major parts, uh, the infrastructure part and the restoration part. <clears throat> now the infrastructure fortunately is now 90% completed <clears throat> and it was just completed in November of 2020. The balance of the infrastructure will be completed when the restoration of the cottage is completed. And it's just basically a sequencing thing. But just to give you a sense of the type of challenges we're willing to take on is that that 90% costs $17 million. But that, that is in place, it's paid for, and we're moving now on to the restoration. But before I leave infrastructure, I wanna give you at least a little snapshot of what we provided. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, were, there were really four, four challenges that we had to make sure that, that we met. And, and, most of these challenges are what ca caused it to cost so much. And one of them is that we're on a very steep mountainous terrain. And unfortunately, most of the soil is unstable. So as a result, we had to build 18 retaining walls, all of which are supported by caissons, and some of them as deep as 50 feet below ground. Wow. So that was a huge undertaking and a big chunk of that $17 million. Mm -hmm. We also had to design for ocean rise uh, and the ocean rise requirements was to plan on 50 inches of, of ocean rise by the year 2050. So in order to provide access for guests and service vehicles to get in and out of that site, uh, we had to build a, a, we call it a pathway, but it's really a simulated roadway It'll be partially covered with wood, redwood planks to simulate the old original boardwalk. And the rest of it will be used for our golf carts to move guests in and out. 
Well, if Kate gets those pictures back up, you'll see the concrete um, that is elevated. If you look at it, it's sort of built like a pier that would stick out into the ocean, but this one runs parallel to the ocean and is 650 feet long. Here, I, I'm hoping- Yeah, there it is. So you yeah. see there it starts right at the end of the construction fence and runs for 650 feet. And this view gives you just a great idea of the existing condition of the cottages. And then, so we had access, we took care of that. We took care of ocean rise, unstable soil, but these old cottages, all the utilities were completely shot. There wasn't one single thing that could be used. So we had to go in and replace all the utilities with brand new utilities. So brand new electric power, new fresh water, uh, evacuation system for uh, wastewater, and that combined, those are the four, four really big elements of the project. And it took, as I said, two years and $17 million invested. But now if you think of that as the foundation, the foundation is in place. And we now have 17 cottages left to restore. Uh, the balance of the infrastructure will be completed. And we estimate it's gonna take 40 months to complete this project at $28 million of cost. Yeah, oh. I was waiting for that other million. <laughs> There's still a lot to go into this. Yeah. Uh, so, go ahead, Dan. Okay, so uh, 40 months to complete, $28 million in cost. And I think I'll do, because everybody always raised their eyebrows and said, how can it possibly cost that much? Well, so I'm gonna, take you just for a couple of minutes through the process that we go through. And Dick's very, very familiar with this uh, in order to restore a historic cottage. Um, the first thing that happens is we take hundreds of photographs and catalog every single piece that may have to be removed from the cottage in order to do the uh, basically uh, restoration work. Every piece that's going to be re removed receives a, a mark on it, a unique mark, so that when it comes time to put it back on the cottage, it is ideally goes in exactly the same place that it was removed from. So it's sort of like the beginning of making a big puzzle, putting it all back together. Um, we also have to remove every single one of these have lead-based paint. Uh, that has to be removed and treated. We also remove and, and treat for asbestos. These are known as the hazmat, hazmat operations. And as we remove items that can be reused because the goal is to reuse everything we possibly can, uh, there is workshops that get set up both on the site and off the site in order to restore particularly lumber. That's a very challenging one, but we are able to reuse a lot of the lumber, but also reworking bricks and fixtures and hardware and anything else that that's, can be reused, they are, re, we do restore. That's a requirement. We can't really throw anything away if it can be restored in a practical way. Mm -hmm. So then, then the next step is we do, add a lot of new work because it's absolutely required either by code or for life safety reasons. So we begin with new foundations. And in this case, all of the cottages, particularly along the shoreline, are receiving full concrete foundations sitting on caissons drilled down to bedrock two feet into bedrock. And again, that is the result of the ocean rise concern. And I have to tell you, there's many of these cottages that are just sitting on boulders. They don't even have foundations. And how they su survived for a hundred years, every, we all just shake our head and it's really quite hard to believe that they've survived as long as they have. So then what happens after foundations, we start the reassembling process and new elements are added only where necessary, but there are quite a few we have to add new electrical, new water pipes, uh, sprinkler systems, 
and a very important one is earthquake protection and of course new roofs for every single cottage. That all gets integrated with the parts that were taken apart, uh, stored either off-site. We, we actually had to dis disassemble three of these cottages and store it in a parking lot uh, up in north in the north area of the park. Could you mention uh, that, Dan? I just wanted to jump in. We did have a, a question in the chat. Someone with an eagle eye has counted the cottages and noticed that there are 14. Uh, which is true because three of them were taken off site. Yes. I stopped it here because you can see a little bit on this uh, aerial view, Dan. Um, maybe you can tell them about the cottages there at the, the at the end that have been taken off site. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, that you know the timing is just as I was talking about uh, bringing everything back for 17 cottages from the disassembly. There's a, there's a ramp that goes up to the uh, access road and there's a spot, two spots to the right. That's a disassembled cottage area. And then you go all the way to the end and it looks like our faces are in the way of that, but all the way at the end, uh, there were two structures removed there. So a total of three were totally disassembled and the reason for that is the retaining walls were so big and so huge, the access was impossible to build the retaining walls with the cottages in place. So that's a good that's a good uh, catch by whoever observed that. Yeah, that's an eagle eye out there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in. Can I just jump in for one moment? I sure. think it would be helpful. Um, if, if you could, I think it would be great to just back up for a second. And and Dick, I'd love for you to help us with this, to talk to us a little bit what did, with what Dan was starting to talk about, and that is historic restoration itself. There are different types of restoration, as I understand it. There's preservation, rehabilitation, all sorts of different things like that. Can you talk to us a little bit about historic res preservation itself and, and the challenges um, inherent in that? Yeah, cer certainly. Um, I don't know if the eagle eye caught that. I'm actually in that video. I'm, I'm standing next to one of the cottages. Um, but, um, you know, for, uh, for in, uh, being a preservationist, what's interesting is, um, you know, Spad Spectra Company and myself, we actually don't do a lot of preservation. So, uh, so there's, a, a, there's a, a difference between the terms. Uh, there's four types of treatment, which is preservation, uh, restoration, um, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. So, um, so reconstruction is when you've lost something, you're rebuilding it. Uh, preservation is technically where you, you, you're really trying to preserve the deterioration and, pre and just preserving the, the actual uh, materials and so on. So you're not really changing it. Uh, but I'm gonna show you a quick, uh, a quick uh, pre uh, example here of, of the difference between restoration and, uh, and rehabilitation, some of the other ones which are more common. And, um, and, and this is just a quick, uh, simple example because uh, these, are, these are some of the structures that we, uh, the historic structures I re rehabilitated on the Paula Reservation, which actually I was the architect and at that time Spectra was our contractor, but now I'm with Spectra. Um, so this is a uh, restoration. So on the left, this is, this is what the, the pretty much the oldest house that still had integrity that remained on the reservation. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of add-ons on the left and right. It, it had deteriorated. And, you're re and they really wanted to have one example of an original house on the reservation. So they took the one that had the, that had the most integrity um, and so we peeled back all the, the additions that had been done and we're restoring it back to the original, the, the original period of significance, which uh, was basically a little bit after the turn of the century where, where these were uh, prefabricated houses shipped in and that's how the reservation was established. So that's, so that's. Our period of significance here in the park is, tell me the exact, Dan, do you know, or Dick? Uh, yeah, I, it's right around the World War II, right before and right after World War II. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Dick, go ahead. Yeah, and, and that's important because uh, um, 
um, you're really researching, trying to figure out what was, what it was like back then. And I'll, I'll just uh, humor me. I'm going to interject one of my favorite uh, restoration stories here is that I was restoring a, a building um, at the Pachanga tribe uh, reservation. And um, I was trying to interview some of the elders to, to try to figure out how are the original doors looked like. And uh, we were trying to figure out uh, how, you know, because they were missing. And he mentioned that, hey, there's a music band that, uh, that came here in the early 70s, filmed, the, filmed some video, and uh, let's try to look at that. And so we found it. And so, um, so we actually, the, the, the name of the band was The Doors. And so I used the doors video to restore what the doors looked like. So that I, I got a kick out of that. That's cool. So this is restoration. Um, and then, um, you know, and this is an example. This is, a, this is just a couple blocks away. This is the oldest Adobe house on the Paula Reservation. But they wanted to convert this into a community center. So they needed to have some additional space space they want to have a courtyard where they can have some teaching classes and so on and so this is where you're actually doing something to change it for the new use adding on to it so you're still preserving the original structure and leaving the integrity but you're changing it so so that is a uh, um, restoration versus rehabilitation so in crystal cove uh, we're doing largely restoration uh, but with a little mix of rehabilitation rehabilitation because there are some things, you know, um, in terms of seismic accessibility, uh, am amenities, some of the decks are being enlarged and, and more useful for the, the for, for uh, people staying there. So, so it's, it's mostly restoration, but, but with rehabilitation as well. So that's basically what we're doing at Crystal Cove. Okay, great. Thanks, Dick. Um, Dan, just a quick question for you. Now, these 17 cottages don't become 17 rental units. Can you, is it 22 or 23? 22, yeah, 22. Several of them are duplexes. Okay. So we will, we have, it's interesting. We have 22 rental units existing and operating now. We'll be adding 22 more when this project is finished where we'll have a total of 44 low cost units along the coast. Yeah. There's and nothing all, else like this in the state of California. Yeah, and our and the rates on all of these cottages, it's important that we mention will remain low. That's part of our agreement with state parks is that these do remain at really affordable rates because parks mission is to promote access to these spaces and these cultural resources. So the rates do stay low um, and uh, there is one of the cottages, and then I'm going to move on for a minute, but there is one of the cottages that will be a hostel style. It will be built in a hostel style, so almost like a dormitory, that then we will use in some of our programs for overnight high school students to do some coastal engineering and things like that. So there's a lot of different types of cottages in there too, I will say. Um, Dick, can you talk to us a little bit about how this stacks up against other uh, restoration projects that you've been on? It sounds like you've been on a whole lot of different kinds of projects. How does this stuff stack up? What are the, what is different about it? What's the same? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's what interesting in historic projects is, is um, in all, all of uh, design and construction, historic is, is probably about as varied as you can get. Um, and, and, and how it's, uh, how it's, so obviously we're dealing with uh, vernacular buildings versus your, your traditional where it might be a, a, a significant architect or, or a certain example of a high style or something like that. Um, but in terms of- throw around the word vernacular around here a lot, but I'm not sure that everybody on the call understands what that means in terms of architecture. Can you just before you answer, tell us a bit about what vernacular means? Yeah, so um, so certainly different uh, des architectural design might, may have some different periods where it might be a Spanish colonial style uh, building or or a mission style, or or, um, or, or whatever it's a, a modern. Uh, so vernacular is basically that it's 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 a more localized construction. Uh, so the cottages were were very organic. They you know they were localized. They weren't like 
you know, they didn't hire Frank Lloyd Wright to design it, but, you know, but they were, but it was, uh, um, but it was a part of that, uh, you know, growth of the area. And so that, so vernacular itself, although people don't realize it is, it's as significant because of the history, the use and so on. Uh, so in terms of how it's similar and, and different, uh, I'll just show you a couple examples real quick. Um, so how it's different is obviously, as I kind of mentioned, it's vernacular is not, the, the, I'll, I'll use in a local example since this is an Orange County project that Spectra did, which is the Earth Cafe in Orange, California. And so, um, so here it's, this is more about the ad adaptively reusing a building. Um, Really changing it and um, and and the finishes. So uh, so this is an example. Of, this is what it looked like on the left when we started. Uh, when we brought it back to more the the original style, you can kind of see the original photograph on the left. Uh, middle is where we got it and and how we restored it. Um, but here you see um, here you're you're doing more intervention. You're you're do more doing more adaptive reuse where. Where it might be compatible finishes, where, where there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, structural changes to get the, the new use in. Um, here's an example. Uh, we found this uh, old mural buried in in the construction under furring, and we restored that. But uh, again, these are these are um, more. Are, this is more of a, where it's more artisans working on it, craftsmen, where these are handmade tiles and and um, um, and wrought iron and so on. And so, um, and here's another example of adaptive reuse is basically we, we restored their storefronts, but they really wanted it to open. So we had to create a uh, windows that actually open. So this is changing the use. Uh, you're intervening more. There's, it's more about the finishes. It's more about the new use. Whereas I think Crystal Cove, it's, it's more about the original uh, use and the original uh, structures and so uh, what uh, an example of one that's I, I would put more in the same category this is uh, the Culver Studios in, in, in uh, Culver City is uh, these are these are wood frame structures uh, we had a uh, uh, you can see the bungalows in the back these were actually relocated and uh, from another part of the site so and and assembled next to the mansion so so we're doing similar things that we're doing at, at uh, Crystal Cove, which is raising the, uh, the, the buildings up. Uh, here, we're actually physically moving them to a locate the different location and we're weaving it through the studios. Um, you know, we probably could uh, actually here, here is, uh, uh, we're, we're actually using the same moving company that we are at uh, Crystal Cove. So we're, we're using the, the um, same team here. We could have value engineered it and used AAA to move the buildings, but they didn't have the historic experience there. So um, the uh, what I want to point out is that you know you can see here in 1925 when it was open, uh, and it was opened as the Insay Studios. Uh, this is where uh, Gone with the Wind uh, was filmed in these studios. Uh, I didn't get go back to watch the movie yet, but. Um, this is not the main mansion, but it is in the movie as one of the houses. Um, you know, this is uh, when it be was Desi Lu Studios in the 1950s. But um, but you see all through the hi history, it looks the same. You know, it's 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 not changed. And what's challenging about this, which has a different challenge than the first example I mentioned, is that what you don't see is that there is a lot of structural retrofit uh, a lot of effort to get in and put in shear walls and 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 make it where you don't see what really how we intervene and and it's deceptively simple but this is a very complicated project and i think i want to point that out because that's really what these cottages are is it, it seems simple because they're vernacular projects but um but it's very 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 complicated so yeah. um, yeah, I know I, I hear that often about this project is how complicated it really is and how staged it needs to be. And I think that is in part because of the site, which I want to turn to a little bit um, and bring Eric into this. Um, you know, as the park superintendent, Eric, 
the cottages as well as the entire historic district sits in the middle of our state park, which uh, brings with it some real challenges. Can you talk to us a little bit about how parks balances projects and spaces like this while ensuring access to the rest of the park resources as it's going on? How, how do you balance that? Sure, well, that, that balance, Kate, is ever present in most parks. Um, you know, in this case, we have this amazing 3.2 miles of uh, coastal Orange County that is undeveloped and gives us a glimpse of what uh, the entire coast looked like centuries ago. And uh, we also, right in the middle of this, we have this incredible example of what a California coastal community looks like from the 30s. So we balance the natural and cultural resources of this park, as well as meeting the recreational needs of the visitors to this park, um, which are all identified in our department's mission. So uh, every time we do a project here, we review the projects uh, and the impacts of, uh, on the surrounding natural resources and the uh, the, the folks who are here recreating. Uh, we complete any required California Environmental Quality Act review. Uh, based on that review, we need, if we have protective measures or actions that need to be taken, we do that. And that's one part of the uh, review permitting process. Another one is uh, obtaining uh, approval from the California Coastal Commission for our coastal development permit, which uh, involves quite a bit of back and forth and um, um, even though we have both work for the same, uh, our, both our departments are under the resource agency, uh, we both sort of have differing views on, uh, uh, on what that looks like when it comes down to development. So ultimately, it took us roughly four and a half years to obtain our uh, coastal development permit for this uh, the final phase known as phase three, this project. So that's, uh, that's sort of how we balance it. And as needed, you know, if we need to have environmental scientists there um, during certain points of construction. We also schedule, um, we have a lot of uh, uh, rare birds and endangered birds here. And during nesting season, uh, we don't do uh, construction either um, in that area or we'll have uh, nesting bird surveys done and performed in order to see if there's actually any birds in that area. Um, that's just one small example, but uh, I'm looking at the clock here and thinking there's got to be questions out there, so I'm going to cut it off right now. All right. Um, thanks, Eric. Uh, I will say, too, that the Coastal Commission process was long and difficult to get through. Um, as I recall, they also did, the Coastal Commission, invest um, several million dollars, five million dollars in the project in mitigation funds as well. Um, so those are other developers that pay mitigation uh, fees, and then they can go toward projects this that enhance public access to the space and, and things like that. So, um, so they are a, a supporter. So many of you on the call are as well. Um, it's really taken yeah. a lot to get to the point where we are. Um, so I think most of the folks listening on the call have seen this project from the beach. But when you get up close, um, I think it's pretty remarkable for a couple of reasons. To, for an untrained eye, like mine, um, these cottages appear almost barely salvageable. And I would think because of both the way they were built, that vernacular um, style where we use sort of found materials, there's not necessarily an architect plan, um, and, and the elements that they're exposed to, that these cottages have deteriorated significantly over the last couple of decades. So if this is for any of you, really, can you share with us a bit about the state the cottages are in now, um, how they were built and the condition that they're in now? Would you like me to take that, Kate? Sure, Dan, that'd be great. Yeah, well, it's anywhere from amazingly good shape uh, to just terrible shape to the point you can't believe it's still standing. And and almost always the difference is if you look at how it was built, the person or the family that built the cottage knew what they were doing, knew how to do things properly. And as a result, it survived, you know, this 90 to 100 years. And then you look at these others that are practically falling over. And it's quite obvious that it might have been the first attempt to build anything. But it's still amazing that it's still standing. And, I'm, and I wasn't kidding. We've, we've found cottages where 
There's no concrete foundations. Uh, corners are sitting on a big boulder and the boulder's not even anchored into the ground. And that's not all of them, but uh, it is quite amazing that they're all still standing. But I'll tell you, we really need to keep pushing on this project to get it done because I, another five years, a lot of them are gonna be gone. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it really has lit a fire under all of us, I think, seeing them deteriorate and knowing that we really need to get in there now to salvage what we're able. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat that I wanna uh, bring to the, the full group. So um, number one, Dan, I think you can probably answer this best. Has, has, the COVID, has COVID and the pandemic impacted the, the project at all in terms of slowing it down or any work stoppages? Uh, the answer is no. Fortunately, we had almost no COVID episodes. Uh, we've had we've had some workmen that have come down and have gone had to go off the job for you know the, the proper quarantine period, but fortunately, uh, it's considered an essential industry construction, so the project continued. It was never stopped for one day. Yeah, um, great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I saw another question. We do have uh, more to go on this project. Um, so I think this question is for you, Laura Davick. Will there, will there be a public campaign to raise the additional 28 million? Maybe you can give them an update sort of where we are on funding, the campaign perspective and where we go from here, just in general terms. So for the campaign, you know, we're in the process of evaluating a variety of different options for funding. Um, that last campaign, which was roughly about 19, but I think we ended up using 17 on the infrastructure, um, that was a big challenge for our organization. So right now we're looking at a variety of different opportunities. Nothing is completely solidified at this point, but just rest assured we are turning over every stone, whether it be private financing, some public financing, maybe bond financing, what have you. But um, our team and our executive team, our finance, uh, our finance, finance committee, is looking into some interesting options, which I don't know that I can disclose at this point. <laughs> but we will still need more money. So rest assured, yeah. we will have some campaign. <laughs> but the exact size of that, I think, is yet to be determined. Is that a good answer? Perfect, Laura. Thank you so much. <laughs> you get it just right. Um, I saw another question was, was how was how has the pandemic uh, impacted fundraising? And we certainly, um, on the state, you know, the state and Eric, maybe you can speak to this a bit. I know, you know, state parks has endured some pretty big cuts. Um, they've really had to tighten their belts as we have at the Conservancy as well. We still feel very optimistic that um, we will be able to continue on with this project, that it will not um, face any stalls in terms of continuing the project until all 17 cottages are complete. We've got some good things uh, going, which we will share when we can in terms of how that will happen. Right now we're working on, maybe Dan, maybe you can, can give an update a, a bit on this about how we're doing the construction right now in terms of tranches of construction with these first four and then when they'll be open. Can you give a bit of an update on that piece? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> just following up on the, on the funding side for a moment, um, uh, we should mention that we're fortunate that we have a grant for uh, $4.9 million, and we had some surplus left over from the infrastructure. So we've put together enough money to uh, undertake the construction or restoration of, uh, it's really it's really three buildings, but there's five rental units involved. So it's very significant. And we're about four months into that. We started that right after the infrastructure was completed. And uh, I expect roughly a year from now, uh, we will be maybe putting furniture in those cottages and cleaning them up and getting them ready to go in the rental inventory. Yeah. So that will be the first time in you know, about 15 years of effort to get this project moving. We'll actually see some revenue coming back, which uh, will be very delightful. That's fantastic. A um, couple of other questions from the chat. Somebody asked if there might be volunteer opportunities uh, toward the completion. That's a possibility. We do have some volunteer stewardship days that we try to do in the park, and we may be able to do those around some landscaping issues in that uh, for North Beach as we 
get toward completion because the site is pretty delicate. I mean, it's, it's a difficult site. We really can't allow access to the site for volunteers at this point, but certainly something that we want to think about and how have those opportunities in different areas of the park as well. Um, here's another question. Uh, this one I think would be for Dan. Um, these North Beach cottages, they're wondering if they will be different price points on the North Beach cottages than the existing ones. Uh, the answer is that they will follow identically the pattern that we have for existing cottages. And, and basically the cottages are, are set up in price based on, on a small size, a medium size, and a large size. And that's predicated on the number of people that sleep in, a, in, a, in each cottage. So they will be identical. Okay, great. Here's another one. Um, in the video that we were showing that Ariel, it does, somebody says here, it's apparent that the water is already reaching near the, the boardwalk and pathway. Sea rise projections were made, but it seems there's already a potential of, for example, storm water that will breach the walkway and possibly reach the cottages. Is that a fair observation? Um, so talk to us a bit more about that sea level rise and how the cottages are set up to manage that. Okay, well, we, uh, once we had the requirement, we invested, I don't mind telling you, uh, it was almost $200,000 with one of the premier ocean rise experts that does this type of design work. And fortunately, he had a lot of data on Crystal Cove. In fact, he has data all along the entire coast of California and about a hundred years worth of storm data. And what he did is he took, and fortunately, one of the good things about Crystal Cove, that beach is more gradual than normal. It is not a real fast fall off. And so it tends to help mitigate the, the waves from getting all the way in. You know, it's, a lot of the energy has already been dissipated. But the answer to the question is that um, some very interesting diagrams were created and literally, uh, predicted the worst case at 50 inches of rise. We're not anywhere close to that, folks, as, as you well know. Uh, and the determination was made, and it literally would figure out how far up over top of the pathway these waves would roll and whether they would reach any of the cottages. And we actually had four cottages that were so vulnerable that they're being raised. So that's an uh, adaptive thing that we had to do. So they were being raised approximately two feet to give them additional clearance. But I will tell you the most important thing is that that pathway is built that I, I'll tell you, I doubt very much that we're ever going to see any destruction of that pathway. We put a lot of money into it in all first class materials. Yeah. Um, I wish we could just keep going because there still are questions we haven't gotten to and I feel this real urge to answer all of them, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time um, and note that we are coming up right up on six o'clock. Um, so I, I want to say thank you to everyone. I, I do want to give Laura Davick just another quick moment if there's something that you'd like to add before we finish here tonight, Laura. Yes, um, I would. And, you know, I just want to let people know that um, for people that are wanting to learn more about being part of this with their family and perhaps getting involved, uh, um, you know, feel free to reach out to either Kate or myself and we can share with you. There is a, um, a wonderful donor recognition plan that, um, that exists for families that want to be part of this. And we know that this park means so, means really the world to so many. And we're so grateful that you've joined us this evening to learn a little bit more about Crystal Cove and why it's so important to our community and really to our planet with all of our education and conservation programs. And I also want to, besides obviously thanking state parks, want to thank all of the various state agencies we've worked closely with, our pledge makers, our donors, our elected officials, and you who have, are, are part of this legacy. So once completing the legacy project for California, this park will have a sustainable future. And I believe that each year Crystal Cove becomes even more important than the last. 100 years from now, or even a year from now, can you just imagine what an incredible impact this park will have on future generations that have never been to Crystal Cove? 
because you see it's it's more than just cottages and there's only one crystal cove and it's right in our own backyard and we're we're so fortunate to be able to love it protect it and enjoy it and i know we all love it so much thank you thank you so much thanks so much for everything that you have done to ensure that crystal cove state park and our little historic district are restored and forever protected Dick and Dan and Eric, thank you for the work that you do day in and day out to ensure that this project is completed, that we do it in a smart way, preserve those donor dollars, and that ultimately we create more resources to, to support the park and the work that we're doing here. I really wanna say thank you to our North Beach pledge makers. You made all the difference. You are the reason that this project keeps going. Uh, we are grateful to you. So many of you are on the call tonight. Can you show up for Crystal Cove? just about every time we ask. Uh, and we're so grateful for that. So to all of you who joined us, thank you. You are part of this remarkable group of people that encircles Crystal Cove and protects it. Uh, make sure that it, that it is around for generations to come. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Our next event in our series is slated for March 18th, just ahead of World Happiness Day, which I think we all really wanna mark this year. Uh, we'll have Beth Allgood here with us. She's the founder and CEO of One Nature. Uh, who will talk with us about the connections between happiness and nature. And then our, our speaker series in April will feature, I think it's in April, but check the website, don't quote me on this, which will be with Brett Sanders. For those of you who are asking about the sea level rise piece, um, I think that'll be a great opportunity for you to learn even more about that part of it. We're gonna be really uh, taking a deep dive into sea level rise and coastal engineering. So um, be sure to look for that one in April as well. And I just wanna say thank you so much to all of you, to our panelists and to all of you on the call.